Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I feel very honored <coughs> to present this year's uh, Jim Mansell's uh, lecture. I think you should very be very proud of Jim Mansell and all that he established for the care of people with intellectual disabilities in England through his scholarly work and through his policy work. So, thank you. Um, I better start with introducing myself. I'm now an emeritus professor of healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, apart from that, I've been working all my professional life, about 40 years, as a physician, as a physician for people with intellectual disabilities. In the past 30 years, I've been involved with research and teaching as well. I will int also introduce you to my team, uh, who did the largest part of the work I'm going to present now. On the big picture, on the right side, you see the majority of the team who was in Melbourne at the Yassid conference uh, last year. PhD students, my uh, successor, and, yeah, the, and another, uh, another researcher, some other researchers. Jenneke, one of our senior researchers, is on the top left. She was not with us in Melbourne. And we are especially proud of Anneke and Henk, who you see down left, who are our experts with intellectual disabilities, who work in our center for one day a week, and who are on the payroll of Radboud University Medical Center. We are especially proud that they are on the payroll, not as volunteers, but with a salary. Uh, I gave this title that we are getting better with, but when I was preparing my lecture, I wondered if we indeed got better in research, education and patient care. So I decided that we are going to explore it in this lecture. I will begin with a story, a real life story. When I just started as professor in Nijmegen, a nearby GP came to visit me in, in my office. She had a problem, she said. The problem was that when she saw people with intellectual disabilities in her office, quite often the people couldn't tell their story. Of course, they knew that they had pain and maybe they knew where they had pain, but that was it. Not how long the complaints existed, where exactly the pain was located, if they ate well, if they could urinate, etc., <coughs> etc. Et and then the accompanying staff didn't know anything either. They said it was on our working schedule that we had to go to the doctor. But of course, that doesn't help the doctor to get a medical history. So she had to, uh, to ask the patient to come back with someone who knew the medical history. And if they were unlucky, she had to order them for a third time to do a physical examination, because you can only do a physical examination if the patient feels relaxed enough to let the doctor touch him. And then it could happen that they had to come back a fourth time for urine sampling or blood sampling. And then once the doctor has a diagnosis and she can propose a treatment, she has to be lucky. She said, she said I have to be lucky. Uh, when staff or the person themselves or both remember what should be done. And quite op often things went wrong. And she said, what I fear are the casualties, the unnecessary death and the unnecessary problems that could be <coughs> uh, pr uh, prevented if people did what I asked them to do. And, <coughs> and she said, can you do anything to improve that? Can we work? on a solution for this problem. And this became the inspiration for our first uh, research project. But before I can say something about our research project, I have to give you some idea of the landscape of care for people with intellectual disabilities in the Netherlands. You may recognize this picture as a painting 
by Johannes Vermeer, a famous Dutch painter from the 17th century, and I use it as a metaphor for the landscape. What I have to tell you about the background, of course, is how people with intellectual disabilities live. Until 20 years ago, most people with intellectual disabilities lived in institutions. They are closed down now, nearly all of them. Um, a small majority lives in campus-like facilities, like the picture you see on the left. Houses grouped together around central facilities for nursing, for paramedics, for psychologists, <coughs> etc. And the majority lives in ordinary houses in the communities, like we all do. The figures I have here are from 2013. 13. And you have to believe me when I say that since 2013, <coughs> the figures on the left diminished and the figures on the right rose. The background for care for people with intellectual disabilities, I think like in most countries, is the UN Convention for the Rights of People with uh, Disabilities. This, of course, inspired to move people from institutions to small living facilities. And healthcare is especially inspired by Article 25 from the UN Convention, which says that people with disabilities should enjoy the highest attainable status of health, like their peers without disabilities. But people with disabilities should be supported to access healthcare facilities, which is not always easy. And then the healthcare. Like in the UK, we face budget cuts. A few years ago, in 2014, the annual bu budget for care for people with disabilities was 28 billion. And that 28 billion was one fifth of the total healthcare budget in the Netherlands. And the total healthcare budget in the Netherlands was about 14% of the gross annual product. That's a lot. It was rising every year, so the government decided that things should change. They changed legislation. Uh, one of the things they did, which virtually cost no money, is that they moved housing, which still was on the healthcare, housing for people with disabilities, to the Ministry of Housing Affairs. But, of course, they did more. They cut the costs for transport, they cut the costs for daycare, which seriously uh, affects at least the well-being of people. And that, of course, has its effects on healthcare. Healthcare itself, uh, its starting point is organized like in the UK. People go to, for primary healthcare, they go to nearby GPs. And what we do have in the Netherlands, what you don't have in the UK, is that we have specialist ID physicians. Specialist ID physicians used to be <coughs> the doctors who worked in institutions, but nowadays, the last nearly 20 years, it's a specialism. It's a three-year training, more or less like the GP training, but more specialized on uh, disability-related uh, health problems. And there is a register. There, there are requirements for the register. You have to do the training. You have to fulfill other requirements like being on call, uh, doing intervision, and a few other things. And you have to renew your, reg your registration every five years. So it's a protected specialization, which is which aims at improving the healthcare for people with disabilities. And the other thing you have to know when you work in healthcare for people with disabilities. That once you see a patient, you not only see the patient, but the patient may be accompanied by a family or a member or a legal representative, or if he's not there, he's in the background uh, wondering what's happening. And there may be a paid carer. The paid carer and the family members uh, have different interests sometimes competing, sometimes cooperating, but you have to keep that in mind 
as a doctor when you see the patient that there is a whole dynamic behind it okay and with all this at the back of your mind we can now move on to research you have two research lines one is research on primary health care and the other one is research on empowerment or inclusion I'll start with telling you, telling you about two of the projects in primary health care one is the project on health information exchange and the other is the project on proactive health monitoring I start with this schedule which is a product of the first project on health information exchange unfortunately it's Dutch I cannot translate it in the center you see the patient fortunately that's the same word and then the GP the care staff and there in red on the top is the family they are more or less the center but apart from them there, is a de there may be a dentist there may be a pharmacy there may be psychiatry there may be psychologists there may be home care there may be care for uh, addicted people there are more family members there may be day activity people or colleagues from work etc etc it's hard it's hard for the patient but it's also hard for the GP to get an overview of all these people and if there's no coordination I can tell you it's a mess to work with it this project is the project which is which is done by Mathilde Masterbroek, you see her picture here uh, down on the right and what she did was interviewing people with disabilities I think she interviewed about 90 people, 20 with disabilities but also care staff, family members, GPs and GP uh, assistants and what came out of all these reviews is that from the perspective of the care demanders the information exchange between doctors and patients is challenging the reasons for that are time there's always a lack of time doctors are always in a hurry they are indeed overloaded at work always but there's also a lack of time from the care staff perspective who are underpaid and never have enough time so that presses there's also a problem with continuity the underpaid care staff never stays long enough to know the patient well and for some reason GPs also tend to come and disappear and with this lack of continuity the person with disabilities feels uncomfortable and unsafe and the other thing that mainly care staff but also family brought up that there is a delicate balance between supporting the patient and respecting autonomy because you want to respect the person, you want to respect his decisions but sometimes he can't and it's always difficult to find the middle between that the professionals and especially the GPs have different problems one of the main things I think is that GPs expect that care staff it's like parents and that they know everything about the patient but of course as you may know care staff doesn't they can't so that gives problems and this all results in impaired history taking and decision making exactly what my colleague from the beginning said but now proven by say 90 interviews what we could do with all these uh, interviews is make a list of factors and actions that could be used to improve primary health care for people with disabilities. Matilda made this list and she did a Delphi study amongst physicians uh, and uh, amongst care staff how we should prioritize and where we should start with improving primary health care. And that is where the project is now. So that's to be continued.
The other project within primary healthcare that I'm going to talk to you about is about proactive health monitoring. Esther Bakker, the lady there in the right, is the main PhD student working on it. It is about annual health assessments. You know annual health assessments in the UK, they are done here. It's proven that they have effect, that diagnoses are earlier made, and it positively affects preventive health care. In the Netherlands, we never did these annual health uh, exams. It was said that since we have specialist ID physicians, it was, it's unnecessary because if there is a real ID problem, you send the person to an ID physician. But as long as the TP does not notice that there is a problem or that nobody else signals that there is a problem which needs referral to an ID physician, nothing happens. So in the past years, with more and more people living in the community, the need is felt to start thinking about health, uh, annual health examinations. And that is where Esther comes in. What she did is doing focus groups with GPs, well, they thought their responsibility to people with disabilities, and they said, yes, we do feel responsible for the people with, in, with disabilities within our practice. And they also said that they were willing to do annual health exams, but only if these were evidence-based. And that is where Esther uh, came in. We learned from literature that all the available health examinations were proven effective, but we know nothing about their validity, feasibility, uh, their uh, acceptability. At least there is no documentation in literature, research literature about it. So we had to, to start uh, somewhere. And what we did is make a list of issues that could be, that could put, be put into these um, annual health exams. And then we did an uh, online Delphi study with, with GPs, what they thought they could do in an annual health exam and which would make sense. We now have that list that's completed um, and maybe it's feasible, but if you have a list of issues, you don't have a questionnaire, which is understandable for patient and carers. So what we are doing at this moment, and that is the problem that the, the project that's currently on, is that people with disabilities are interviewed with, say, uh, a pilot questionnaire, and then they can give their feedback on the questions to reformulate it into really understandable uh, questions. The first two uh, interviews with patients are done. I have seen the interviews, and they give suggestions about uh, rewording, giving examples, etc., etc., and this process is repeated several more times. We think about 10 to 15 times until we have a list that is workable for patients and carers, and which can then be completed either by patients and family or by patients and nurses. That will be, will be the end of Esther's project, but we already got additional funding to test the questionnaire in practice, because if you really want evidence-based, you have to have the evidence that it works. But that, in due time, that will come. So far, primary health care. Our other research line is on what I call empowerment, and I will tell you about two projects there. One about healthy living for people with intellectual disabilities, and another one about inclusive research. First, the project on healthy living. Here is Noortje Kuiken, you see her on the right, the PhD uh, student. And she also interviewed lots and lots of people. She started with interviewing people with disabilities, and then she interviewed all other stakeholders, and she made an inventory, and that was only in our region, about available facilities for physical activity. She interviewed 21 persons with intellectual disabilities, and here is 
what they said they needed to live healthy. To, to live healthy, you have to feel healthy. You have to be happy and you have to be independent. But what you need from others is motivation. Others have to stimulate you to eat healthy, to move, etc. etc. You need support from supporters. But also the environmental factors are important. For example, where do you live and where do you work? Can you walk to your work? Or can you ride a bicycle as we do in the Netherlands? Or do you need public transport or a bus where you sit and don't do anything at all? But environmental factors is also the example that care staff can give. Do they like cooking? Do they prepare healthy meals? And do they prepare healthy meals with you? Or do they, pref do they prefer to go to McDonald's, etc.? And do they like to be active in the evenings? Or is it just watching television? That makes a lot of a difference, they say. And then, of course, uh, stakeholders had things to add. And one of the main things that they said, if you want to develop something, it should be simple and practical. And that brought us to developing this, health, uh, this assessment instrument for physical activity. What you see here on the left is an empty instrument, where you see two ladders, one on the left and one on the right, where a group of people with disabilities can say where they are at the moment, for example, in the, in the yellow or in the more uh, orange region, and on the right, where they want to be. Of course, they all want to be in top green, I think. And on the right hand, you see an instrument which is completed by a group. This instrument should, this assessment instrument should be used in a group of people, for example, a living group or a day activity group, where people can stimulate each other and where they can evaluate together on a regular basis if it's working or not and what they need to make it work. And if you look at the picture on the right hand in this slide, you see what they proposed to do to do tennis, to do soccer, to do other sports, but also to do the shopping, to walk a dog, to clean the house, to clean the car. There is much more physical activity than only doing sports. We are pilot testing this instrument now, which means that several groups made a plan like you see here. Then they have an activity a measurement, not with an ActiWatch, but something similar where you can register for 24 hours the movements that the person make. Then they do it, say for example two weeks, then they do an evaluation with the researcher and with their staff member. And then they again are measured for a day if their physical activity indeed increases. And if you really want to use it longer, of course you don't have to measure them every four, two weeks. But then you have to organize a, si a system of regular evaluations if it still works and what is needed to make it work better. Again, this is work in progress. But here again, people got so enthusiastic that Noortje also got funding to roll this project out further with other groups than she is testing now at the moment. So far this project on healthy living. And then the last project, research project I'm going to tell you about is about inclusive health research. Inclusive research, what we define as inclusive research, is all research where people with disabilities are involved, not as objects of research, but in all other roles you can hold in research. At our university uh, and hospital in Nijmegen, there is a strong patient uh, movement. Patients are on the table with chronic diseases like, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and several other important diseases. And their voice completely changed the direction of research. For example, in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the patients said that their main problem was not the pain, what the doctors thought, but their main problem was the fatigue. And you, you get fatigued by your arthritis, but you get 
even more fatigued by all the medication that you get for your arthritis. So it completely changed the direction of research. So we wondered what would happen if we got to talk to patients with intellectual disabilities about their wishes and ideas about healthcare research. We started with a Delphi study. Uh, all uh, international publishing uh, researchers on inclusive health research were addressed if they wanted to participate in our study. And we wanted to come to a common definition of what is inclusive health research. Why you should do it, what are the attributes, what you think it is, and what should be the products of such a research. And after that Delphi study, which is completed and published, we did a, a case study in several places to see how it worked in practice. We, Tessa visited places in the Netherlands and in Ireland. Oh, and I forgot to say, I think that this project is done by Tessa Frankena, is the main researcher, the girl in the brown sweater. And on her side you see Anneke and Henk, I told you already before about them, and they work as co-researchers on the project. Okay, so after the Delphi study and the case study, uh, people with disabilities were interviewed on a national basis, why they participated in, in research. And they gave three reasons why they participated in research. <coughs> they wanted to learn from it, they said. They found, they found it important to be respected as a person and they as an expert. And it was also nice, they said, to have a job. Okay, and with all this information, we wanted to develop a guideline about how we all should do inclusive health research, because from literature we had seen that there were so many methods and there was no consensus about it. This consensus, we worked on it through uh, the YASIC, the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual Disabilities. You may know it from their regular three or four annual meetings worldwide, European meetings, etc. We prepared it before, we invited people to participate it, in it, and then we had meetings at the Melbourne conference last year, and afterwards we collected all the information and feed, feedback we got into a guideline. Uh, academic researchers could only participate in this project if they also brought in their uh, colleagues with intellectual disabilities. Um, and finally, some 40 persons with or without disabilities joined in this, pro this consensus statement uh, project. Uh, and there we could develop uh, guidelines. That we, we learned about reasons why people should do it. Uh, the attributes they gave to it and what the results should be. And we also got information about research directions and how you should publish your research. And one of the nice things that came out of it is a kind of research ethos that everybody appeared to have. And with research ethos, I mean things like if you want to do inclusive health research, like inclusive research in general, you can't be in it for the money because it costs you more time. You have to do more effort. But also, if you do inclusive research, inclusive health research, you both the academic researchers and the persons with disabilities, both must be willing to learn from it. You should be able to set up a system of financial compensation that may, might be a challenge because of the, the funding that uh, uh, people with disabilities get. But in our situation, it proved possible to give them a real salary for their work. And that's important to, fi to feel uh, to respected. Okay, the guideline is nearly uh, ready. There will be an uh, international publication, an English publication about it. 
there will be an online uh, easy read version for people with disabilities and then of course we have to see if it works so far my uh, research uh, project our research project I should say but that's not what my colleague from the beginning asked she did not ask for research of course she knew that research would be necessary but she wanted to improve practice and if you want to improve practice from an academic perspective you have to work on teaching teaching for undergraduates for postgraduates and the other thing is you we have to be innovative in practice and we did do that in our outpatient facilities for people with disabilities this is teaching here you see a picture of the last time that I did this once a year annual lecture this is a mandatory lecture for second year undergraduate medical students it's mandatory how I did it was that I, that I you see me there in the picture that I interviewed people with disabilities about their wishes for healthcare and their wishes what doctors the students should learn about them but that was before I met Anneke because once I met Anneke Anneke said I can do that lecture myself and she nowadays does that lecture together with Henk and with Tessa in the background as their supporter of course but the main message from Anneke and Henk to the students is if you are a doctor please talk to me don't talk over my head to my care staff or my mother or my father but talk to me it's a very powerful uh, message I think that they give and here is what the students gave as feedback from this this year's annual lecture we now have a, a system called Shakespeare it works via your mobile phones and the lecturer can ask questions to the students beforehand and the students can ask questions to the lecturer and I give you examples from both one of the questions to the students was who had experience with people with intellectual disabilities and it appeared that 50% had experience that may sound a lot and of course that's not all family although there's always more medical students with family with disabilities than you think but in Nijmegen there are several care providers and medical students are very popular with them to do for example night shifts they are cheap but they have more expertise than your, your next door neighbor so there is a lot of people with uh, medical, medical students who have experience with people with disabilities and two examples of the questions that students ask is are you happy and how does it feel the label of ID it may be confronting questions at least I think that they thought it and it's easier to to pose these questions through your cell phone than in person I think and of course they got an answer you may realize that once a year a lecture is not enough to really work on the improvement of health of people with intellectual disabilities but we managed in the past years to include intellectual disability health problems in a lot of other modules in public health in ethics in genetics urology psychiatry and several others that I forget we offer electives we offer electives in practice where they can uh, work with a specialist ID physician for for example four or six weeks they can do electives in research where they join three months in a research project and actually most of the projects that I presented here had one or more medical students working on part of it and then we also have postgraduate courses for GPs if you train as a GP in Nijmegen there is a module on communication uh, with people with um, disabilities that you have to do in your training and we also have um, an online uh, no not an online it's in person uh, an, uh, a course you can do for your uh, credit uh, points once you are a GP and you have to renew your registration every few years that was teaching and now healthcare uh, innovation five years ago 
that we established in this uh, general practice a specialist ID practice. In this building there is an office where once every week an ID physician uh, sees the people with intellectual disabilities that are referred to her. There are three hers working there in shifts. <coughs> people with disabilities can be referred either by their GP or people find us on the internet and refer themselves, which is both possible. <coughs> and here is an example from a patient who came a few weeks ago. The man said to the ID physician, Doctor, I'm not crazy. They are making me crazy. And what appeared when the doctor sat down to listen to his story, the man had problems with serious ringing in his ears, which is a common uh, aging problem and needs an absolutely different treatment than psychotropic medication, which he had got and which made had side effects in him, by, which made that he felt his yeah worsening. <coughs> Once he got off his psychotropic medication, he had proper medication for his earring. He improved a lot. Every year the practice sees more people with disabilities. Last year it was about 200 patients that were seen in this practice. So we think it fulfills a need. And apart from these uh, consultations, uh, oh no, uh, we do these consultations and we, uh, you can reach us by uh, telephone. We do a common uh, triage with an uh, outpatient facil psychological facility for people with disabilities. And the telephone uh, uh, is manned five days a week on office hours. So once you call uh, in an office time, you always get someone on, on the phone who can make an appointment for, for you with a doctor, a specialist ID uh, physician. So it works. And apart from these uh, referrals, the specialist ID physicians are also uh, giving consultations for patients with intellectual disabilities in a hospital. They are involved with transition patients who are who used to be with the pediatricians and who are too old for the pediatrician who are growing into adults with intellectual disabilities and to maybe future clients, patients for the ID practice. And what we also do is giving consultations together with clinical geneticists for people with rare syndromes. Of course, you need a diagnosis, if possible, for your genetic syndrome. But geneticists know a lot of um, genetics. They are very good in advising to the family, etc., etc. But they don't know anything about comorbidity. And in a team of an ID physician and a geneticist, you can do wonderful work. So families are very happy that we are doing there. That's practice. All this owes a lot to the academic collaborative Stronger on Your Own, Stronger on Your Own Feet, so as our group is called. It's a cooperation between Rabat University Medical Center and nine service providers all over the country. There's financing involved. But more important is that it gives a floor for workers in practice and researchers to communicate their co concerns and results. The group meets, the group of representatives of course, meets every three months to, months to exchange problems that may need studying and to exchange research results. And I think it's, it's very good for both parties. So if you're asking me, how are we getting better? I think, yes, we got better in these past three years. <coughs> we have our research results uh, by which we involve GPs and which makes that GPs more and more send their patients to our outpatient clinic. More important, I think, is even that people with disabilities are on the table. They have a voice in what we are doing. They advise us 
in our research. The people with disabilities are more visible in the training of undergraduates and postgraduates. And it all influences each other in a positive way. So if you ask me, did we get better? I think, yes, we got better. My colleague from the beginning who came to my office is also content with us. This is more or less my presentation. If you want to know more about the work we are doing, here I give you the contact addresses of the main researchers and of course my own email address so that you can reach us if you have additional questions. And more for the handout, here I have some references of uh, published articles in uh, uh, English literature from our work so far. Two slides. And then once more, I want to thank all my colleagues who did parts of the work that I presented here. And that's it, unless you have any questions. And if you have questions online, you have to email.